So I wanted to um, do a couple things today. The first is, uh, you know, obviously it's Mother's Day. And I say obviously because I absolutely forgot to say Happy Mother's Day to my wife. So don't be me. Um, yeah, I know. There you go, Linda. That's fine. Uh, don't be me. Don't forget to do that. Uh, you know, wives, they appreciate that. Um, so now I will publicly shame myself and bring honor to my wife, um, as I am so good at doing. So, uh, you know, I can't say enough about my wife and I love her with all my heart and she's an incredible woman, as you all know, uh, and hopefully you agree. And if you don't, then, um, that's, you know, between you and the Lord, I guess. Uh, but she is an amazing woman. So Vicki is, I, I could not ask for a better wife. She has been so uh, incredible as a helpmate in ministry. And she's the only reason I can do this. Uh, she's the only reason we can even, I, I could be a pastor or uh, I can step into this role. You know, she's the reason I was able to finish my master. She's the reason um, I was able to, uh, you know, take this job. She, you can ask Pastor Peter because he was there, um, but she had absolutely no hesitation when I told her I felt like the Lord wanted us to be here. And um, she didn't even want to go talk in the hall. She just said, yep, no, nope, we'll do it. And uh, I can't ask for a better wife than that. So someone who uh, trusts and uh, believes the Lord with you and comes alongside you is an amazing thing. So I just want to encourage all of you, um, make sure that you reach out to your moms. Also, uh, I have to honor my mother-in-law who was here, Grace, who is she's walked away from her computer, but I don't care. So I, I love her. Um, she's been incredibly influential in my life. Not only has she taught me um, proper conduct for ministers, and that should say a lot to you guys because you know how I am now. So imagine what I used to be like. Uh, but she um, she's just an amazing woman of God. She loves the Lord. Uh, she's absolutely incredible, cries out to the Lord for us and for our kids and um, is just such a great woman. So uh, I know many of you haven't really gotten to meet her, but, you know, do everything you can to get to know her because she's an amazing woman. And I'm sure she would love to hear from you and uh, encourage you as well as she encourages us. Um, I asked you last week to start to think about the gifts that God has given you. What are the gifts that God has given you? Um, I, I hope you agree with me that I adequately proved to you that the Bible makes it very clear that every one of us has been given gifts. Every one of us, right? Peter says, you have all been given gifts from the Lord. Uh, Paul lists several gifts and says, these are the gifts. And I also told you that I was referencing a book. It's called Discover Your Spiritual Gifts uh, by Peter Wagner. And it's, it's been really good. I've been reading through it and, uh, it's, it's been a real positive. So, um, I want to read to you today, uh, the 25 spiritual gifts he identifies, and you don't have to try to write them down, Kira. I'm going to save your wrist. Um, I will email it out to everybody. So you guys have it. Um, so these are the 25 spiritual gifts he has identified through scripture and through the lists that are in scripture, um, or where he finds, um, inferences, uh, of things and says, yeah, this scripture kind of confirms this one, right? So let me read this list to you quickly. Uh, prophecy, which he describes as preaching or inspired utterance. Service, which is uh, ministry, which is ministering to people, loving people. Teaching. Exhortation, which is stimulating faith and encouraging people. Uh, giving, which obviously is contributing, generosity, sharing. Uh, leadership, which is authority and ruling. Mercy, uh, which is symphony. Uh, sympathy, comfort to the sorrow, showing kindness. Um, those are all listed in Romans 12, 6 through 8. 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10 and 28 adds these to the list. He didn't, he didn't want to repeat the ones he already had. Uh, wisdom, which is wise advice and wise speech. Knowledge, which is studying and speaking with knowledge. Faith, healing, miracles, discerning of spirits, tongues, uh, speaking in languages never learned, and ecstatic utterance. So that, as I've told you before, right, that is not um, the that that is not uh, your personal prayer language, right? The Bible makes it pretty clear uh, that part of part of our relationship with the Lord is an infilling experience, uh, and typically that's identified right with the utterance or speaking in other tongues. Um, but not, not always in the Bible. There's one instance where it doesn't say anything about tongues, but there's five or six that say tongues. So um, the Assemblies of God's position is that people speak in tongues when uh, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. I'll kind of leave that there. Um, but this is talking about tongues for the edification of the body, the kind that Pastor Peter has sometimes. 
uh, and other people have had in our church, right? They uh, stand up, they feel like the Lord is um, put something on their heart and they say it out loud and it's in a different language. And then uh, God gives someone else in the body, typically um, the interpretation of whatever it is that person said. Um, that can be a strange experience if you've never experienced it. Um, I've had that happen where we had one person get up and give the tongue and then somebody else understood what they said and didn't even realize they had said it in a different language. And we had to explain to them, yeah, no, God is giving you uh, the interpretation. That's what that is. Uh, sometimes if there is nobody there who can interpret the tongues, God will use the person who gives the tongue to interpret. And that is something we have to be careful of as a church. Uh, not that uh, the, the, in our church, right, we've seen Pastor Peter do that, but we also have a relationship with Pastor Peter. We know Pastor Peter. We have, I have no doubt Pastor Peter hears from the Lord and would never do anything to uh, go the wrong direction. But there are Christians who will give a word in tongues and then give you the interpretation of that word. And it usually is some sort of attack or some sort of demeaning thing. It rips the body down. It doesn't build it up. So the best way to tell us something's from the Lord is, does it build our body up? Does it encourage us or does it discourage us? Because God is not going to use tongues to attack or discourage us. He's going to build the body up. That's what the word says. Uh, moving on. So there's tongues and the interpretation of those tongues. There's uh, apostle, he calls it, right? Apostle is kind of similar to leadership, right? There's the, there's the, term apostle, um, which you guys have heard, right? The apostle Paul, the apostle Peter. A lot of times apostle means someone who has had a personal encounter with Jesus, like physically. Um, that's how people use the term apostle. And that's why a lot of churches uh, refuse to acknowledge this as an office. They think that's all apostle means. But really, um, apostle or an apostolic calling is when God calls somebody to be over several things at once. So um, what that means is, you know, it's, it's kind of like a leadership gifting, but it kind of is married to the prophetic um, preaching gifting, if that makes sense. So um, there are certain people that God has empowered or given the uh, gifts to manage large things. Um, the apostle Peter does this, James does this, uh, Paul does this, right? They all have different branches and, and groups that they uh, are over. Um, helps. This, this is just coming alongside and being a support. That's literally all it is, but that could be your gift. Maybe you are just called to be a helper. Uh, maybe you are called to just come alongside and just help any way you can, and it brings you a tremendous amount of joy. God gives that as a gift. Um, another gift that he lists is administration, which is getting others to work together, um, just getting everybody on the same page. Uh, these are the last seven he lists. Uh, evangelist, pastor, which he specifically lists as caring for God's people. Um, this is not pastoring in the sense of what a pastor is in our church, where um, I preach, but I also you know, handle the business stuff, and I also handle the direction of the church and all this other stuff. Um, this is literally like someone who just calls and checks in on people and loves them and does whatever they can to pastor them or shepherd them, right, or encourage them along. Uh, then you have these five, and these are the five he adds from other places in Scripture. As I said, I'm going to send this list out to you guys. I don't feel like you have to write it all down, and they have the references next to everything. Um, he has celibacy, which is an interesting one. Raise your hand if you want that gift. He wants the gift of celibacy. No? Nobody? I don't see any hands. Maybe there's some hands, but I don't see them because I have to scroll through to see you guys. Um, celibacy, that is a gift from the Lord. Did you know that? That Paul says, you know, I long that everyone could be uh, basically married to the Lord like I am, that they could just do whatever they needed to do as a single person. And, and that is a gift God gives certain people. I did not get that gift. Um, in fact, many people don't get that gift, which is why it's so interesting. But it is a gift. It's a gift from the Lord. Voluntary poverty. There's another one, right? This I would tie very closely with missions many times. Um, you agree to go to a very poor country uh, in Africa or in South America or, or in America. I mean, there are parts of America that are poor. Maybe you're called to go uh, minister to the people in the Appalachia area in West Virginia that just have nothing. Um, this is a gift. It is a gift that you can receive from Lord. Voluntary poverty. Uh, martyrdom which uh, is being killed or dying for your faith, uh, taking a stand and being willing to stand up and say, nope, this is what I believe. And if it costs me my life, it costs me my life. There are people being martyred every day still. Um, this is a gift from the Lord that you might have the ability to be willing to go 
and, and handle that. Um, missionary, and then hospitality. Do you guys know anybody in here who's good with hospitality? I'm all, we're all staring at you, Donna, just so you know. So I hope you feel uncomfortable. Um, Donna, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Donna has a great gift of hospitality, doesn't she? You ask her to bring one thing and she brings eight, that's a gift. <laughs> that's not that she can't follow directions, it's a gift that God has given Donna. So, all right, those are my 25. Those are the 25 we're gonna focus on. I'm gonna send the, send the uh, list out to you. And what I want you to do, all right, is when you get the list from me, I'm gonna give you more homework. So I pray that you spent time praying about this and asking the Lord, you know, show me some of my gifts. Show me how I can be an impact to the church, to your body, to people around me. Um, I, I want you to really pray and ask the Lord, you know, to show you uh, exactly what he's gifted you to do. But what I want you to do in the meantime is I'm going to send this list out to you. And I want you to take time to think about each of the gifts and then write someone's name from church next to it. And then once you've done that, can you email that back to me? Because I'm going to keep a record of it and I'm going to put it all in a database. And then we're going to see what people think. Because do you know that you may have a gift that you don't even realize? That other people, when they think about you or they think about uh, how God has used you in their life or could use you in their life. Um, you never even would have identified that gift, but maybe eight or nine people in church say, oh yeah, no, Linda, she's great at miracles. She's always doing miracles. And Linda will go, I don't, okay. I don't, <laughs> okay, Lord, like, is this my gift? But maybe it is, and you don't even realize it because God wants to use it in your life. So um, can we do that? Do you guys mind doing that for me so that I can get start getting that together? Because I think it'd be really encouraging to see all the ways other people see us as gifted. Um, don't, uh, by the way, don't look at this and just think to yourself, oh, you know, that those are the only gifts. I don't think those are the only gifts. This is just a list we're going with right now, right? There's gifts of worship that aren't here. Um, intercessor is a gift, I think. Um, the gift of intercession, or uh, as I heard recently, God's Navy SEALs uh, getting sent in and, uh, you know, praying behind enemy lines for things and trying to liberate the captives and everything else. That's a pretty cool gift when you think about it that way. Um, there are other gifts, but these are just the list we're going to go with for now. So if you uh, don't mind doing that for me, I would really appreciate it. If you don't do it, I'm not going to like send you a nasty email or anything, but um, what I want to do over the next you know, three weeks, four weeks, is we're going to look at gifts and giftings. And uh, this is why it's so important that you guys participate in this, all right? I know you all have a million things to do now that you're trapped at home, but this will probably take you maybe five minutes to just go through my list and send it to me. So please, please do that um, for the benefit of the church and the benefit of your fellow congregants who are here and um, really fellow lovers of Jesus who are sitting in this room. Wouldn't it be great to get an email email from me that says, hey, did you know, you know, eight people think you have a gift of faith? I mean, that would be a pretty sweet email to get, right? So uh, please make sure you do that for me. I'm going to send this out after service. But what we're going to do is we're going to look through uh, the Bible and we're going to find instances of each of these gifts in use. Um, now, I have intentionally not picked stories involving Jesus. Now you may think that's a horribly unchristian thing to do, but the reason I have intentionally not picked up uh, stories that have to do with Jesus is because many of us, when we look at Jesus, we think of him as an unattainable standard. When we see Jesus, we think to ourselves, well, yeah, he's, he's absolutely God's uh, hands extended on earth, right? But he's also God. And it kind of gives us an out, doesn't it? You know, well, I'm not Jesus. So I'll never be Jesus. So I'm probably not going to use my gift of faith or my gift of prophecy or my gift of whatever, because I'm not Jesus. But when God uses regular people, like we're going to look at over the next few weeks, it's a lot harder to make excuses, isn't it? Then you go, well, I mean, I'm not really like Stephen, but actually you're a lot like Stephen in the Bible. Well, I'm not really like, you know, Joseph of Arimathea or Barnabas or Paul or, well, actually you're a lot more like them than you are like Jesus probably. And it's a lot harder to and make excuses for why you are the way you are, or why you do the things you do, right? So, all right, so today we're going to start, and I want you, you don't have to turn to all these if you don't want to. Um, I have them all up, and I'll read them to you, um, but we're going to be in all over the place, because we have seven gifts we have to get through today. So, 
Uh, none of these are going to take like, you know, we're not going to do 20 minutes per gift. I know many of you would just sign off Zoom. Or you could just mute me, I guess. If you just mute me and then watch TV or something, that's fine. Um, all right. So Judges 4. This is, we're going to start with prophecy. That's the first one on our list. Preaching and inspired utterance. And I went to Judges 4 because it's about a woman and it's Mother's Day. And God uses women and he honors women. Listen to what it says in Judges chapter 4. Uh, we learn about a woman named Deborah, who was a prophet. It says, Deborah, the wife of Lapidoth, was a prophet who was judging Israel at that time. She would sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the city country of Ephraim. And the Israelites would go to her for judgment. One day she sent for Barak, son of Abinam, who lived in Kadesh in the land of Nephtali. She said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel commands, you. He commands you. Call out 10,000 warriors from the tribes of Nephtali and Zebulon at Mount Tabor, and I will call out Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors to the Kishon River. There I will give you victory over him. All right. Does she stutter? Does she say anything that is unattainable? Does she do anything that seems weird or anything else. No, she's literally giving him a directive from the Lord. She's saying to him, this is what God is saying to you, Barak. Listen to me. You're going to get 10,000 warriors. You're going to go out and then God's going to call the enemy out. And then you're going to fight. And what's going to happen? You will have victory over him. End of discussion. End of story. She makes it very, very clear for him in this instance, doesn't she? She is clearly speaking on God's behalf. She has an utterance from the Lord that she shares with him. Listen to what he says to her. Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. Okay, well, that's interesting, isn't it? She made it very clear to him that it was him who was supposed to do this. And he says, well, that's fine, but I know that God is going to protect you because you're the prophet, so you have to come with me. Listen to what she says. Very well, she replied. I will go with you, but you will receive no honor in this venture. For the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak. This doesn't seem like that big a deal, except it's a huge deal if you understand Middle Eastern culture, because in Middle Eastern culture, honor stems from the father. The father of a tribe, the father of a nation is where all your honor is kept. And when God commands you to do something, and he gives you an assurance of victory through someone with the prophetic gift, someone who preaches like me or Pastor Peter, uh, someone who stands up and says something they believe God has very clearly put on their hearts, and they know that the Lord is saying to you, you will have victory if you do this, and then you choose to do the opposite, do you know that that may cost you honor? That may cost you credibility with other people? All of a sudden... If I said to you, you know what? I like to pick on Linda, so I always pick on Linda. So I'm going to pick on Linda. If I said, Linda, yeah, she, she is a good sport about it. I haven't gotten a call yet where she says, I wish you wouldn't do that. Uh, in fact, she tells me all the time she hopes I do it more. So listen, if I said to Linda, though, look, Linda, I, I was in prayer. I know this is the Lord. He said to me, you know, I really want you to go and minister to your sister who isn't a believer. You're going to go and you're going to love her. Uh, and this is what you're supposed to say to her and whatever. And she says, Okay, Pastor Ben, but you have to come with me. It completely robs her of the gift God wants to give her. Because in that moment, God is trying to build up confidence in Linda that she does not have, right? Or in you, if we substitute Linda with you. He's trying to build up a gifting that you don't realize you have. He's trying to show you, hey, there's more to life than what you think. Hey, you have the power to do this through me. Through the power of my Holy Spirit, you can do this thing, whatever it is. And I'm using a prophetic person to encourage you and get you to the place where you will take a step of faith and be willing to step out and do this for my glory. That is an incredibly convicting thing to me because there have been times in my life that people have said, you know, I really think the Lord is, is telling me you should do this. And it has confirmed something in my heart because really prophecy, especially personal prophecy, should always confirm something that God has already said to you. If it doesn't, it's probably not God. But if God has been pressing on Linda's heart in our example and saying, go talk to your sister, go talk to your sister, go talk to your sister. And then I say, Linda, I feel like the Lord wants you to talk to your sister. 
That's God reinforcing for her what he has already said to her. That's God coming alongside and using the gift he's given me to encourage her to do the thing he wants her to do. And that will change her sister's life if she's obedient. But what if she's not? What if she's not obedient? What if Linda says, you know what, Pastor Ben, I just, I, I can't, you have to come with me. So I do. So I say, okay, fine, I'll go with you. That's fine. I love you. I, lo I you know, this is obviously what God wants you to do. I'm happy to come with you. And I go and I take over the conversation like I do, because I always like to talk. And then Linda gets nothing out of it. Maybe her sister gets saved, but it costs her her encouragement. It costs her her gifting. It costs her the ability to see that God wants to use her the same way God uses me or whatever the case might be. That there's a cost to not accepting when God is urging you ahead. And in this case, it costs Barak and his entire family honor. And in the Middle Eastern culture, honor was everything. Your ability to be honorable had everything to do with your children and their future, with their calling, with every part of their life, with their inheritance, with where your money went, with where everything else went. If a man had honor, you never had to worry about someone coming and taking their land or taking anything else because they were an honorable man. And not only that, but your children will be blessed because of it. So it costs him his children's blessing. It costs him his honor because he's scared to do what God makes it clear he's supposed to. And God uses someone with the prophetic gift. Let's keep going. What's next? Next is service. For service, well, that's not what I wanted. Oh, that's why. All right. For service, we're going to be in Acts 13. Acts 13. In Acts 13, verse 1, we read about Paul and Silas, people who are committed to ministry, who are being called to go forth and do what God has asked them to do. And the reason he has asked them to do it is because he wants them to participate in his service. Among the prophets and teachers of the church of Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon called the black man, or sometimes you'll see it said Simeon Niger, right? Niger is just a Greek word for black. Uh, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. They commissioned them. They say, you are being commissioned for God's service. This is obviously something God wants you to use your life for. Uh, you have been called to service. You are being called to do the thing that God has asked you to do. And now we're going to commission you and send you out to do that thing. This is a commission or a being sent on ministry. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. There in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. Afterward, they traveled from town to town across the entire island until finally they reached Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Pallas, who was an intelligent man. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elmias, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, infer interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked the sorcerer in the eye. Then he said, you son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. When the governor saw what had happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit makes it clear they are called to service, doesn't he? In this, in this story, the Holy Spirit is making it very clear they are called to service. He is commissioning them. He is sending them out to service. He's saying, Paul and Silas, I have a great plan for your life. You're going to take John Mark. You're going to go into this town. You're going to go and you're going to minister to this governor. On top of that, you're going to go from town to town, preaching in the synagogues and doing the things I've called you to do. The Holy Spirit commissions them and encourages them and strengthens them. And they go boldly. And because they go when God tells them to go, he honors them. 
They go and they stand before this uh, governor, which would have been nerve wracking enough. And now you have what comes up, but a sorcerer, someone who it says he has, he has taken and put himself in. He's attached himself to the governor. Do you know that when God commissions you for service, you will face resistance? If this is your gifting, if this is the gift that God has for you and he's put it in your heart to go serve people, he's put it in your heart to minister to people, you should expect resistance because chances are if God is sending you to serve people, the enemy has already entrenched with them. The enemy has already sent people around them to discourage them or pull them down or give them depression or do any of these other things that this sorcerer is doing. What's really interesting is bar Jesus. What that means is the son of Jesus. That's all bar Jesus means, son of Jesus. Now, obviously, he wasn't <laughs> Jesus' son like we know Jesus, right? So his father might have been named Jesus, but not the Jesus we know and worship. So he's a fake. Ooh. He's a fake. He has Jesus in his name, but he doesn't live like him. He's not related to him. He is not the one that you would expect to see when you go and minister to other people. He's bar Jesus. He's the opposite of what you want to see when you go to serve people. And then it says his name is Elmas or Elimus. And when I looked it up in Greek, do you know what it means? It means sorcerer. His name is literally sorcerer. That's his name. They call him sorcerer. They say you are a sorcerer. You are a magician. And the thing about sorcery that's really interesting back then is that sorcery was a status. It was a status symbol. You had power. Oh, he has power. He has this ability to, to do different things. And what's the first thing that happens to him when he interferes in what God has called them to do? God robs him of his sight. Now, why is that significant to us? What does that have to do with our life, right? We're stuck at home. Uh, Mike is stuck at the lake, but the rest of us are at home. And uh, we're trying to figure out, right, what, what is it that God is, is trying to say to us today through this? And I think the answer is, when you have the gift of service, you should expect not only to face confrontation, but expect a doppelganger, expect a fake copy of what it is that God is going to call you to do. If he calls you to minister to someone and love them, they probably are involved in being loved the wrong way. If he calls you and asks you to serve a group of people and they don't know who they are, expect someone close by whispering in their ear and encouraging them in an identity that is not from the Lord. If, they, if God calls you and says, you know what, you're going to go minister to this, uh, this woman, you just are going to come alongside her and just feed into her and do everything you can to love her. Uh, when you do that, what's going to happen? Oh, well, you're going to find that there's other people trying to do the same thing, but they're doing it for the enemy. They're not doing it for you. Expect to face resistance. Expect that you will yourself will face an alignment. You'll face some form of sorcerer in our society. And it could be that you go to love somebody and they're being influenced by some social media influencer who has nothing to do with the Lord and everything to do with themselves. And they're trying to get them to just be more like themselves. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe God says, go serve your children, love them. But you're competing with YouTube personalities and you're competing with Facebook and you're competing with every other thing that's building into their identity and into their character. And God says, listen, I have called you. You have the gift of service. You can change their life if you choose to. But instead of choosing to, we get scared and we back up and we say, Lord, this must not be what you have because I can't do it because I'm facing resistance. Resistance is just a sign that you're going the right way. Do you know that? That when you face difficulty, usually it means you're going the right way. When things are hard, the best way to get through them is to go through them. Not go under, not go around. Have you ever sung the song with the bear in the woods, right? Can't go under it, can't go over it, gotta go around it. But you can't go around it, you can't go under it, you can't go over it, right? You have to go through it. You have to. Going through it is what's going to release the giftings God has given you. Choosing to go through it. And you know what you may find as you go through it, this isn't the gift that I think, I think I have a gift, but I don't. But go through it nonetheless. And then make that decision. All right, moving along. That's service. Let's talk about teaching. Here's an exciting one, right? Not for me, but for Pastor Peter. He likes this one. Pastor Peter has the gift of teaching, right? We can all agree on that. Some other people here have the gift of teaching. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 6 says this. 
This is Paul, and he's talking to Timothy, who is his spiritual son. It says, if you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching you have followed. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle, for our hope is in the living God, who is the Savior of all people and particularly of all believers. Teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all believers in what you say and in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. Until I get there, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers, and teaching them. Do not neglect the spiritual gift you received through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. Give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your tasks so that everyone will see your progress. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. What is Paul saying? He's saying, Timothy, you've been given the gift of teaching. We know you've been given the gift of teaching. It's been conferred upon you by the laying on of hands. People have acknowledged your giftings. You are young, but you are called. You are young, but you have the ability God has called you to do. And so you're going to step up and you're going to stand up and you're going to say, God has called me to this church. He has put me here. He knows what he's doing. Even if you think he doesn't, we're going to believe together that God has given me the gift of teaching and I am going to teach you everything Paul has taught me. Isn't it interesting though, that just as we talked about with prophecy and just as we talked about with service, and now as we're talking about with teaching, what is the common thread with every gift? There is and will be resistance. Almost like the enemy knows that your life will be completely different if you choose to be released with the giftings God has given you. In fact, he knows that if he makes you ineffective now, you will never be able to bless the church or the community of believers the way you're supposed to. And so even in the Bible, we see resistance, 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 resistance to the teaching that Timothy has, resistance to the prophecy of Deborah, resistance to the service of Paul. There's always resistance with a gift. Don't ever forget, no matter what the gift is, there is resistance that comes along with it. You're about to see that firsthand because we're going to move on to exhortation, which is stimulating faith and encouraging people. I couldn't think of anybody but Barnabas for this. Barnabas means encouragement or son of encouragement, right? It also, though, means son of um, lament or, or, or basically someone who comes alongside you when you're sorrowful and walks you through things. That's the name that they gave him because he would come alongside those who were hurting and he would love them in the midst of it. Barnabas is a great person to study, but, but listen to what happens, all right? So we know from our service earlier, John Mark had gone with Silas, uh, or I'm sorry, not Silas, he'd gone with Paul and he'd gone with, um, and, uh, he'd gone with Barnabas, right, into ministry. Listen to what happens. Uh, in Acts 15, 36, it says this, after some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them and Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, and as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care when he traveled throughout Syria and Sicilia, or Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. Barnabas is an encourager. What does he face as he tries to encourage John Mark? Resistance. I know you're all muted, but I'm going to trust that you're saying it. He faces resistance. Why does he face resistance? Because when you have a gift, what do you face? Resistance. 
every single time. I know we're not a church that usually answers back to the pastor, but listen to me. I want you to so deeply get this in your heart because if you don't understand this principle and you don't apply it to your life today, you will never be able to operate in the giftings God has given you. Resistance is a sign you're doing something right. It's a sign that you are stepping out and doing the thing that God wants you to do because you face resistance because the enemy wants to drag you down. And if he can drag you down and stop you from being effective, then you will be ineffective. Who was the one Jesus got the angriest at with the talents? Right? We know talent means money, but we like to take an allegorize, don't we? We say, oh, well, I have five talents and I have 10 talents and I can do a hundred things for God. Well, that's good. But who's the, who did he get angry at? He got angry at the one that did nothing with it. It wasn't the ones who tried and failed because they didn't fail when they tried, did they? It was the ones who did nothing. So as we look at this, I, I think I see encouragement in this because Barnabas doesn't give up on John Mark, even though John Mark had failed. John Mark had left. He had gotten scared and he ran away. And sometimes in ministry and sometimes in life, we get scared and we run away from God, don't we? And we need those men and women of God who will come alongside us and say, I know you were scared. I know you didn't do this because you, you were angry, or I know you didn't do this because you were trying to get away from the Lord. I, I know you made a mistake, and so you, you took off. And, and part of making a mistake is realizing, yeah, you know, we all make mistakes. But Paul is interesting, isn't he? Because he doesn't approach John Mark as someone who made a mistake and needs to be forgiven. He approaches him from a legalistic way. And he says, I'm not taking him with me again. He abandoned me once before. What's funny is later on in the Word, if you read through it, Paul actually is reunited with John Mark, and God restores their relationship. But during this period of time, Paul is so legalistic and so dogmatic that it separates him from the person he's been in ministry with since the beginning. It causes a split. And then Barnabas and John Mark go off and do their own thing, and Paul and Silas go off and do their own thing, because Paul couldn't handle it. But God uses Barnabas as an encouragement in John Mark's life. Imagine if Barnabas never was there to encourage John Mark. John Mark would have spent the rest of his life feeling like a failure, wouldn't he? Oh, I let them down. Oh, I screwed it up. We need people who have the gift of encouragement who come alongside us and say, you may have made a mistake, but God still wants you. You're still valuable. God still loves you. There's still a purpose for your life. It's not some accident that you're here. God didn't make a mistake. He didn't use you the wrong way. He didn't screw you up. You're not a failure. He didn't mess anything up in your life. No, you need to be encouraged. You need to have somebody come alongside you and encourage you in the Lord to tell you and remind you who God says you are, not what the enemy is telling you about yourself. That's a gift of encouragement and exhortation. Uh, next is giving. I want you to go to Luke 23. Luke 23. Or I'll just read it to you, which is also fine. Uh, when I think about giving, there's a lot of different people we could use. I was going to use Ananias and Sapphira just to make Ryan laugh. But we used someone else. Don't worry. Uh, when I think about giving, I think of a man that most people don't think about and someone who you may not have even heard of because it's, his name is only said a few times, but I think about Joseph of Arimathea. He was a rich man who loved Jesus. Yes, yes, they do exist. There are rich men and women who love Jesus. It's not always poor people who love Jesus. There are rich people too. And he was a rich man who loved Jesus. And that's significant back then because Jesus as I've mentioned before to you all, is this homeless traveling rabbi who's changing the world for God's glory and bringing in the kingdom on earth. And he doesn't care about wealth and he doesn't care about these things. But what's interesting is Joseph of Arimathea loves Jesus and Jesus never tells him to get rid of his wealth, does he? No, because his wealth doesn't own him. And you'll find out about that in a second. If you go to Luke 23, verse 50, it says this. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph. Just stop there for a second. Wouldn't that be just a great way to be defined? Yeah, they were good and righteous. If I died and that's all people said about me, I'd be pretty happy about it. But listen, there's a good and righteous man named Joseph. He was a member of the Jewish high council, but he had not agreed with the decision and actions of other religious leaders. He was from the town of Arimathea in Judah, or Judea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. He went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Then he took the body down from the cross and wrapped it in a long sheet of linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb that had been carved out of rock. 
This was done late on Friday afternoon, the day of preparation, as the Sabbath was about to begin. As the body was taken away, the women from Galilee followed and saw the tomb where his body was placed. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to anoint his body. But by the time they were finished, the Sabbath had begun, so they rested as required by the law. Joseph gives Jesus his tomb. He surrenders to Jesus something that he had for himself. He is generous and he is loving. And he says, Jesus, I, I, I'm going to give you everything I can give you now that you're dead. Uh, I've given you everything I could in life, and I'm going to give you everything I can in your death. And he gives him his tomb. And many scholars believe that that cut out in the wall was Joseph's tomb for himself. They had made that tomb for himself, but he, he gives it to Jesus. He's generous. He's giving something to Jesus that would have cost a lot of money back then. And on top of that, it says that the women have oil and they have spices and they have everything else. And I wonder where all that came from. Now, I can't prove to you that it came from Joseph, nor does the Bible say that. Um, but I would like to imagine he had something to do with it. And that is my creative imagination. So don't, uh, don't get angry at me. That's my creative imagination. I'm allowed to have one of those. I would like to think that Joseph had something to do with it because he was wealthy and he was willing to give Jesus his tomb. So it stands to reason he'd give people oils and spices and anything else they might need to prepare Jesus' body the right way. That is a tremendous, tremendous gift that God can give people. And there are people in our church who are very generous, who understand that everything they have is a gift from God anyway, and that we're willing to just give it all away because it all belongs to God anyway. And that is really cool, I think. I think generosity is a very hard thing for people to have as a gift, um, especially if you grow up poor or you grow up in a way where you didn't have the things you needed. It can be very hard to be generous, but God takes and he transforms and he shows people and gives them confidence in their abilities, confidence in their business uh, abilities, confidence in their careers. And he says, look, I can make you generous. I'll make you generous and then I'll reward you because of your generosity. It's really neat. It's this cool principle where when you give, God honors it and he blesses you and then he gives you more because he trusts you because he knows that you don't get attached to the thing he gave you. Very hard. I know we don't talk about giving very much, but you know, we need to be faithful in our giving, if for no other reason than to remind ourselves that God is in control, not us. Um, for me, that's, that's why I am faithful in my giving, to say, okay, God, well, I still trust you, even though there's a pandemic, even though there's uh, trials, even though there's troubles, you are still the king of kings, not me. You know the beginning from the end, not me. And so I will give faithfully because you called me to do that. And you say you will supply for all my needs, and he does. But I think people who have the gift of giving or generosity, God gives them even more. Um, and that principle, you can see that played out in the world, even when people aren't Christians. It's really neat because it's a principle that God has placed over the earth. When you're willing to give, you will receive in return. It's reaping and sowing, right? It's, it's an interesting principle, but we're not going to hammer that any longer. Uh, all right, we're almost done. Leadership, go to Acts 15. Acts 15. And we're going to read about leadership. While well, Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers. Unless you are circumcised, as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles, too, were being converted. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted that Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told them about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. 
When they'd finished, James stood and said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. And this conversation of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. Conversion, I'm sorry, of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. As it is written, Afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, all those I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. So the long story short here is that they acknowledge that God has called the Gentiles into the fellowship. And I love what Peter says. Why would we burden them with something we couldn't bear? Why would we burden them with something we couldn't bear? But do you know what he uses in order to make that argument? He uses his gifts and leadership. He looks at the whole picture and he says, look, why are we going to try to ask them to do something? We all know that we're saved because of God's grace and it's undeserved grace through Jesus. So if we have undeserved grace through Jesus, why in the world would we make it harder for them to come to Christ? He, he stands up in front of everybody and he makes that determination. And then James backs him up, doesn't he? And this is a gift of leadership in my mind. It's a gift of being able to make difficult decisions. See, leadership is a difficult place to be in. I, I used to think all the time, oh, I just want to be a leader. I just want to be a leader. And now that I've been a leader for many years, I think to myself, man, sometimes I wish I could just leave things alone. I wish I could just be a follower. It'd be nice to just follow what everyone else says and what everybody else does, but there's this righteousness inside of me, right? There's this frustration that wells up inside of me. And I go, oh, it's being done wrong. We have to fix it. We gotta get it right. Ah, and I, I just can't let it go. But trust me, there are times I wish I was oblivious and just floated through life and said, ah, well, whatever. But if that happens to you, if you start to get frustrated and well up and, and say, man, there's something wrong here, then you might have a gift of leadership. Do you know that? You may be someone who has a gift of leadership. Now, what's interesting is in America, what we tend to do is just leave a church if we can't get our way. But what if God wanted to use that gift that he had given you? What if he wanted to use that gift he'd given you to, to come alongside and say, hey, we can make this place better? One of the most frustrating things for pastors is when people come to check out a church and then they don't come back. And the reason they don't come back is because the kid's ministry isn't great or the nursery isn't right or whatever. They go, come help us. Like, come help us make it what we want it to be, right? We all, that benefits everybody when we do that, doesn't it? It, it benefits anybody. Yeah, Gene's excited. It benefits everybody. In, in the end, right, we, we didn't have a teen church. So then Gene and Terry came to me and said, can we have a teen church? I said, absolutely, let's have a teen church. There's no reason not to have a teen church. So then we had a teen church. Look at that. They saw a problem. They presented the problem. We fixed the problem. That's a gift. That's leadership. It takes a leader's eye to look at those things and say, I want to be involved in this because I know it will help everyone. Melissa did the same thing for us with the harvest party last year. She just came to me and said, look, like, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to organize anything. You don't have to buy anything. I'll do everything. I just think we should have a harvest party. I said, okay. And I remember, Melissa, I'll just be completely honest for everybody. I remember saying to Vicky, I'm like, man, I hope this goes well. Like, I don't know how Melissa plans things. And then she did such an incredible job. It was so amazing and everything about it was so professional and so well done. It wasn't ramshackle like when I just do things last minute. It was incredible. And I remember thinking to myself, man, what a gift she has. What a creative gift. What a gift of leadership to see that something would benefit the community. And then we had what, like five or six or seven or eight kids come who uh, just don't come to church and, and, and don't even know the church, but it got them in the door. It got them interested to see what we were doing. And they stayed for hours, a few of them. Listen, that's why we did it. That's why she stepped up and did it. But that's a gift of leadership. That's looking at something and saying, this can be improved. I want to see it improved because I believe in the mission that the church has, and I want to see where the church is going to go. I believe that God has called us to reach Wyndham, and so we're going to do it through harvest parties. We're going to do it through teen church. We're going to do it through any other way. So if that stuff drives you nuts, then you may have a gift of leadership. All right, last one. I told you it was going to be long. Sorry, you're going to have to deal with it. The last one is mercy. When I prayed about it, I just heard my wife huff, by the way, when I said that. Uh, not the mercy thing, that you're going to have to deal with it. Uh, that was a loud huff, Victoria. Um, <laughs> the, the last one we want to talk about is mercy, right? The gift of mercy. When I think about mercy, 
I think about Stephen. Stephen is an amazing man, um, not just Stephen Southard, but Stephen in the Bible too. Uh, mercy means sympathy, sympathy, comfort to the sorrowing, showing kindness. That's what the gift of mercy is. That's what the gift of mercy is. And when I think about mercy, I think about Stephen. In Acts chapter 6, it says, But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. Hallelujah. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. This was a big deal. This is them accusing them of being racist. You ever been accused of being racist? We live in Maine, so probably. Uh, being accused of being racist is a big deal. They're being accused of being racist. They're being accused, and they're, and they're saying, well, you give the Jewish women more food than you give the Greek women. That's racist. That's what you're doing. You're preferring them over us. So the 12, which is the disciples, right, called a meeting of all the believers. And they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. Can anyone say amen to that? Uh, they don't want to run the food program. They want to be able to teach what God has put on their hearts. And so brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, <laughs> Parmenas and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Stephen is a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. He's a man who wants to get involved in service, but I also see him as a man who's merciful. It seems as a man who's merciful because the very next sentence says, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to debate with him. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Sicilia, and the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom uh, and the spirit which with which Stephen spoke. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, we heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. They roused the people, the elders, and the teachers of the religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. If you read Acts 7, I'm not going to read it all because it's really long, but I absolutely love it. It's probably one of the best defenses of the faith you will ever read. Uh, and Stephen gives a defense of why he believes what he believes, why he knows that Jesus is the son of God, why he's giving God um, all the glory, why he's willing to stand up and say what he needs to stand up. He is incredibly merciful. And why do I say that? Because the very last line says this in Acts 7, as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Who prays that? People are whipping rocks at you. They're, you're, you're getting hit in the head. You're bleeding. You're ugly. You're nasty. Ugly stuff is happening, and you're praying, God, don't, don't charge them with this sin. That's mercy if I've ever heard it. I, I don't think I have that gift necessarily. I, I don't think I could do that. I always wondered that about when Jesus is crucified and he says it, when Stephen's dying. I always thought to myself, man, I would be like, they couldn't write down the stuff I would say to people who were throwing stones at me. Like, they, they would not be able to write that down. I just may not have the gift of mercy, but Stephen absolutely does. And maybe you do too. Maybe when people hurt you and they harm you, you can say, Lord Jesus, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Maybe when people betray you and come against you and come along and make you feel worthless or make you feel like you haven't done a good enough job, you have the amazing compassion and ability to be merciful and love them through it and say, I understand I know that they're weak. I know that they're people. I know that they're not the people who, uh, I, I know this isn't how you feel about me, God, but this is how you, how you would react. You would, you would ask for forgiveness toward them. You would recognize, oh Jesus, that, that you love these people, even though they're hurting me and they're sinners. And you would want me to act mercifully in the midst of a terrible and tragic situation. Ask yourself today, 
as, as we close with this, I want you to ask yourself this question. Do I have any of these seven gifts? Do, do, has God used me uh, in prophecy in some regard? Has he used me in service? Uh, has he used me in teaching or exhortation, giving, leadership, or mercy? Uh, which of these is a way the Lord has used me? Because he's probably used you or tried to use you in some of these, and you just haven't realized it. That's the first thing I want you to ask yourself. The second thing is, when I face resistance, do I give up? When resistance starts, when things start to resist the giftings God has placed inside me, do I take that as a sign God doesn't want me to move forward? Do I take that as a sign? It's such an easy cop-out, isn't it? Oh, Lord, well, you know, I wanted to do this for you, but then this happened, so this must not be your will. Are you guilty of that? Some of you are laughing. Are, have you ever done that? Have you ever said, oh, God, well, this isn't, you know, okay, well, this must not be what you want, but really it's exactly what God wants. He wants you to face resistance and then endure through it and be able to come out on the other side and say, wow, God has really given me a gift for mercy because I should hate these people, but I don't. Or, wow, God has really given me uh, a gift of prophecy because I knew what that person was supposed to do, and they did it, and God really blessed them because they were obedient to what he uh, had told them in their private time and then used me to encourage and, and, uh, and come alongside them with. I really want you guys to ask yourself this because God willing, in the beginning of June, we're going to be back together. And I would love nothing more than to have a celebration service where God is using people in their gift where people come in and they say, wow, I know that I was put on this earth to serve, or wow, I know that I was put on this earth to preach, or wow, I know I was put on this earth to be merciful and just love people who are hurting and know that they're going to hurt me, but just be merciful and, and, and encourage them anyway, because they're going to hurt me, but it doesn't matter because I'm doing it for Jesus, not for them. Wouldn't it be amazing if by the time we all got back together and could look at each other in the eyes, we knew and could say, wow, Pastor Peter really has a gift of leadership and we're going to do everything we can to honor him in that. Or uh, Kira has such a gift of encouragement, and we're just going to make sure that we give her opportunities to exercise that gift and encourage people, even publicly, even if she doesn't want it with a microphone. Or, you know, Donna has such a gift of hospitality, we have to make sure we create opportunities for people to use their gifts, because that is what's going to ultimately honor God. Right, Like we talked about last week, why are we doing all this? Because I could talk about anything else over this month. It's because we want to bring glory to Jesus. And the way we bring glory to Jesus is to take our talents and multiply them. It's to take our gifts and invest in the kingdom of God with them and say, Lord, I am yours. Use me to prophesy. Use me to teach. Use me to serve. Use me to be merciful. Whatever you need, Jesus. Because the reality is when you get this list and you look at it, you're going to be able to identify Jesus in every one of these gifts. Every one of them. It's really encouraging. You look through and go, wow, God, Jesus had every one of these gifts. That's really cool. But you know what? I might have one or two, but you know what, God, you can use it. I can serve. I can come alongside and help. I can love. I can be the hands of Jesus extended to a broken and dying world that needs encouragement and needs love right now in the midst of a very confusing time. So let's pray. Lord, we just want to give you our gifts. We want to give you our giftings. We want to give you every part of our lives. I pray, God, that even now as I pray, you'd start to show people. Show them if they have a gift of prophecy. Show them if they have the gift of service. Show them, Lord, if they have the gift of teaching or exhortation. Show them, I pray, oh God, if they have the gift of giving or leadership or mercy. Lord, as we go through these gifts, I pray, Father, that you would just be absolutely glorified through them. God, we want nothing more than to glorify you through our lives. Jesus, make our lives glorifying to you. Make us your witnesses as we, as we proclaimed. Help us to encourage one another. Help us to lift each other up in our giftings. Help us to trust you so that when we are together, people will say, that's a church where I felt loved. I met people who were more giving, people who were more loving, people who were more merciful, great leadership that believed in, in Jesus and his direction, and uh, people who were prophetic and moved and inspired utterances, and people who trusted the Lord with their giftings 
things and said, God, I have gifts, I have talents, you've given them to me and I want to honor you through them. So I ask, oh God, as we pray and as we trust that you would move in a powerful way at Cornerstone, that Lord, as, as we meet together, as we continue to faithfully come to these <laughs> Zoom sermons, as we, as we unite as a body, even digitally over the internet, Lord, that you can still be glorified through our lives and that you will be glorified as we join together shortly. We just want to thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.